Hey y'all, today I wanted to pose what I think is a interesting question. As the world gets richer, meaning as we have more and more economic development, as smaller countries, younger countries get richer, will the outdoors, will hunting, will fishing get better or worse? And, and you kind of see this sometimes talked about in the outdoor space where folks are saying, you know, uh, we need to um, prevent people from getting into fishing because there's not enough room for other people to get in. Um, we need to lock down national parks so that folks don't have access to, to fish for the preservation of the species. And if, if this sounds a little pretty familiar to what I talked about uh, last time when I talked about gatekeeping in fishing, um, there's a little bit of a similarity, but I actually want to expand this idea even further to think about globally what do the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years look like when it comes to fishing and the outdoors, especially as we know that uh, a lot of countries are, are getting richer and richer and richer, and those folks are gonna start to enjoy hobbies like fishing, just like ours. And is this a good thing or is a bad thing for, for fishing, okay? So to do this, we've actually gotta use a different toolkit to try to understand how countries developing might impact fishing or environmental goods or, or really anything in that regard along the developed sphere. And so I th think uh, the, the most helpful tool we could use today is what we could call a environmental Kuznets curve. So Kuznets curve sounds super, super uh, intelligent. I promise it's just one line. And so I'm actually gonna draw it on the screen here so that um, it's kind of clear what I'm talking about, okay? So let's dive in. So the Kuznets curve basically says that if we have an X and Y axis, so if you've, it's been a while since, you know, middle school geometry, remember this is our Y axis, this is our X axis. Okay, the Kuznets curve says, look, if we think about how countries develop, so you could think in, in econ, we typically measure how big a country is by their gross domestic product, their GDP. Um, so a country with zero GDP means they are producing and consuming nothing. So they have uh, zero GDP. There's not really context for that. Maybe hunter-gatherer society. And then of course, the max would be like the US where you know our GDP per year is something like over $20 trillion. Really, really big numbers, okay? But let's just, just kind of keep this on a scale. Maybe that's easy. A zero to 20 scale where the United States is 20 and then, you know, hunter gatherers is zero, okay? So this is our X axis right here, okay? Now, if we think about as countries develop, right, as they go from hunter gatherer society, societies to just kind of general developing countries, right? This is where you might use the word third world country, right? Um, as they're developing, right, we can think that as they develop economically, there are going to be some changes to the country. Now, this can be, you know, industrialization, right, where there are more factories, there are more, um, uh, well, for sure, jobs, more development of productive facilities, all these kind of things that go along with development. Of course, we know at the same time, though, there are some spillovers that occur um, as countries develop that, that folks may be not super excited about. So the original Kuznets curve was about inequality and basically saying that early on in a country's career, so this is where on the y-axis here, I'm gonna put inequality. And the simple theory here that Kuznets put with, with this curve is that initially as countries develop and folks are chasing profits and, and developing, there's high pressure on inequality. So inequality actually jumps up initially for a country. But then as the rule of law, as the country develops, as we uh, develop a taste for more equitable distribution of resources, you actually see kind of a tipping point, and then as a country develops, inequality goes down. Now, that's not really what we're gonna talk about here today, but that's the original Kuznets curve, okay? What I'm interested in about, especially from kind of the environmental perspective or the fishing perspective, is that we could call what we could call an environmental, I have terrible handler writing, y'all, I'm sorry but an environmental Kuznets curve where we're talking about the environmental 
degradation. Just think about damage that an economy asserts on the environment around it. And so when we think about it, this think about this initially, right? Hunter-gatherer societies, right? GDP of zero, put a point right here, put very little environmental pressure on their surrounding areas. Now, it's important to note that, you know, in, in hunter-gatherer societies that, you know, that ended up to settle down and produce agriculture, a lot of times they use fire to burn out forests, right? To create productive spaces for agriculture. Obviously, they were fishing and hunting, so that puts, you know, environmental pressures on the areas around them. So it's, it's not that environmental degradation is zero there, it's just pretty limited, okay? So, you know, if I'm gonna be technically correct here, let's move this point up to say even at a very limited um, amount of, of uh, economic productivity, there is a little pressure on the environment. Now, think about a hunter-gatherer society transitioning to a modern third world country over you know hundreds of years. What does that look like? Well, of course, we would think the environmental degradation is going to go up. So this is putting pressure on um, native fisheries. This, of course, is, you know, um, harvesting local forest. Uh, and then we can also think of kind of some more gnarly problems, right? Uh, chemical production facilities with no um, regulations. Um, dumping of uh, effluent and other things into uh, local rivers because there are no uh, standards that prevent water pollution. Um, overuse of some resources, things like that. So it's not hard to imagine, right? As the country develops, there are more and more and more pressures on those environmental amenities. Now, I wanna pause really quickly here because a lot of ecologists and other folks would say that what happens next is just a runaway train. So I'm gonna use a different color. Basically that for every dollar of GDP, for every dollar of economic development we have in a country, every environmental degradation goes up, okay? But I want us to pause for a second and think about, is that actually true? Okay, so let's now think about the U.S. context. It's hard to think about the U.S. transitioning from a hunter-gatherer society to the modern way it is right now. So let's just call a spade a spade, and believe it or not, in the 1800s, the U.S. was a third world country, okay? No indoor plumbing, no electricity. Again, all the definitions you would typically volley on a third world country right now, the U.S. was worse back then, okay? So 1800s U.S., right, we are in this category right here. We are a developing third world country. So industrial revolution comes home, late 1800s, factories are built, industrial capacity of the U.S. is growing, 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 growing. And then in the 1900s, right, we just put our foot on the throat of the environment and never look back. Except Teddy Roosevelt locked down acres and acres and acres of land across the U.S., because he thought that there was aesthetic value to it, it was worth preserving for future generations, and it was worth preserving for the you know, US, US citizenship. Well, to me, that is saying we're setting aside some environmental resources because it's worth preserving. Okay, fast forward 10, 20 years, right? Silent Spring, which kind of kicked off the environmental movement in the US. What did that do? Well, it led to the creation of the EPA, Clean Water Act, later Clean Air Act, right? These are provisions that the U.S. as a country, right? These are, these, are, these are laws and agencies that were created for no other reason than to reduce the environmental damage we were having on our surroundings. So again, going back to our Kuznets curve, right? You would think, okay, well, we're developing, Ben, and it's just gonna go to the moon like the ecologist. We're just going to continue to damage our our environment, but that's not what happened, right? In the 1960s and 70s and then on to today, our environmental damages start trending down. Why is that? Well, as we industrialize as a an economy, as we focus more on service sector jobs, we not only were richer as a country, so we had time for leisure and for the ability to think about environmental goods, um, we also were able to invest in technologies that would lower the burden of the environmental damages of our production facilities, right? So th things like um, SO2 scrubbers on, uh, there's carbon monoxide going above us in an airplane. Um, 
so think about like SO2 scrubbers on um, coal-fired power p facilities, right? We're still producing electricity that we need with coal, but we're reducing the SO2 burden in the environment around us. Okay, um, things like uh, Clean Water Act, right? We are reducing the burden, right? The damages on the water around us, right? Then when we just kind of let anyone dump into the rivers, right? I, I think there's this, this, this tendency when we think about environmental science and environmental things to always go bad story, bad story, bad story, bad story, and never think about like the small victories um, that are kind of upon us. Like one of those in my, my native Birmingham, Alabama, right in the 1970s because of steel production, you could barely, you know, the, the story goes that the, the sun was orange and there was a band of clouds over the city from all the steel production, okay? That's not the case anymore. Why? Well, we have environmental protections um, for our air quality here in Birmingham, which is a win, which again, coming back to the Kuznets curve, right, is a reflection that our environmental degradation seems to go down the more we develop. Now, a lot of people want to like push back right now and say, well, Ben, there's still a lot of environmental degradation going on. Like, look at like some of our air quality, look at some chemical spills that are happening currently. And yes, Obviously, I've drawn it poorly on this graph that environmental degradation goes to zero. Sure, maybe it's not going to zero, but it is going down, right? Um, think about CFC production. CFCs are, are aerosol uh, chemicals that we use for refrigerants, um, for spray cans for the longest time that were tearing up the ozone layer uh, around the South Pole. We banned those chemicals and the ozone layer to an extent has completely or almost completely healed, right? That's a victory. That is a, again, think this is the downslope of the Kuznets curve, right? All right, so let's take a step back, right? Because a lot of you who are watching are like, okay, I'm just here for the fishing. Like, oh, what does this have to do with fishing? Well, if we think about a fishing Kuznets curve, and what I mean here is recreational fishing. I'm not talking about commercial fishing. We can do another episode about the, the complex dynamics of, of commercial fisheries. But let's think about fishing degradation, okay? And this is where I think it gets fun. All right, Not think, let's start in the 1920s in the US. Still, we're, de we're a developing country at that point. What type of fishing reigns supreme in the US? It's not catch and release, right? It's catch and take fisheries. So think about this, look at, you know, Google old images of bass fishing. We kept every bass we caught because they're also delicious to cook, hot take. Um, we killed every tarpon we hooked. We, you know, we would have stringers of tarpon, these black and white photos of people stringing out tarpon and tarpon are a terrible food fish. These fish actually just ended up in a dumpster afterwards. Okay, so early on, think about what that means for a fishing Kuznets curve. We're doing a lot of damage right here to our fishing resources. But as we start to develop, as incomes rise, as our tastes for more, um, I guess, redeeming styles of fishing rise, and, and I gotta put it out there, and I'm gonna do an episode about this, is that I think the watershed moment that nobody, especially in the fly fishing community, wants to acknowledge, a little thing called bass fishing. Big tournament style bass fishing comes along. Um, Ray Scott, BASS, Right, those folks champion catch and release fishing in a way that is attainable and accessible for most anglers in the U.S. because most anglers live close to a bass fishery, right? And they champion catch and release fishing, right? The idea that you're gonna toss it back so someone else can catch it. And all of a sudden it's like a light bulb turns on in a lot of fishermen's minds. It's like, oh, well, I actually don't need this food fish for my table, I can just throw it back because I'm out here for leisure not for food. Now, that's really important, right? You're out here for leisure, not food. You are signaling, right, you have a level of income where you no longer need to just grab bass off the docks to feed your family, right? You are supplementing your nutritional needs in another way. It's not coming from fishing. And so because of that, come back to this, this fishing Kuznets curve, as we develop economically as a country, our fishing damages start to go down. Now, I know this goes against a lot of people's prior beliefs, right? The idea is that as more people get into fishing, as more people, you know, income go up, things are just gonna get worse. And 
look, I'm an economist. I love being a pessimist. It's kind of like my, my, my second language. But I've got to push back on this a little bit because as we develop, right, the conversations that you ha see happening in the outdoors these days about proper preservation methods, proper catch and release uh, techniques for fish, right, it's a signal that we all care about how these resources are taken care of. It's a signal that we all are trying to do less damage to the fishery, which means we are on the downslope of fishing degradation, which I think is a huge win. This is, again, for, for, for pessimistic fishermen who want to always say thing, the sky is always falling, we got to take a breath here and say there's something cool going on. I, I know a lot of people are grouchy and, and they're like, look, this is going to be a death by a thousand cuts, right? If everybody's doing minimal damage to the species, but there's a lot of us you know, touching the species, then that's a lot of damage. Again, sure, but let's go back to the former episode here at Dorsal and talk about if you gatekeep, right? If you say, well, we're just going to keep people out of fishing at all, then people's latent values for those species that we're talking about are going to plummet to zero. So you would almost, and this is more opinion rather than science, is that you'd almost rather have a bunch of people touching the species, learning how to reduce our degradation of the species, right? Rather than no one touching it at all and allowing it to be steamrolled by other industries, right? Imagine no one goes catch and release fishing for redfish. This would mean that commercial fisheries for bait fish like pogies bait, uh, or the, the, the redfish themselves, those industries would be able to steamroll laws and regulations because there would be no anglers fighting back on that, right? There would be no one to say, hey, no, 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 we value this species, don't mess with it. And so that's where, for me, I see a lot of marriage between this fishing Kuznets curve, right? That we're doing less damage the more we economically develop, the richer we are, the more we care about these species, and the more we allow people to experience the species, the more protected they will be. Okay, so I know that puts me in a weird area, right? Again, very non-environmentally uh, uh, tangential there. This is very, an, very much an economical argument. But at the same point, um, this, this kind of goes against the, the prevailing trend of we need to prevent people to get in, in for fishing. Again, if we want to protect these resources, we should engage and acknowledge development. And then also we should let people go fishing so that they'll love and value the species. All right, guys, enjoy it. See ya.